Welcome everybody. Uh, we are reconvening the 2019 Budget Committee from earlier this morning. I'm going to remind any member of the public wishing to speak further regarding an issue on the 2019 Budget Committee agenda for today may appear before Council at its meeting on January 28, 2019 at 7 p.m. when the recommendations from the meeting will go forward for final consideration. If you wish to speak as a delegation, please sign the sheet located at the back of the room or notify the Clerk's Department no later than noon the day of the Council meeting. Any PowerPoint presentations must also be forwarded to the Clerk's Department no later than noon the day of the meeting. I do have regrets from Councillor O'Meara for this evening. Uh, are there any other regrets? I see none. Any declarations of pecuniary interest since this morning? Uh, I see none. Then I have three registered delegations. Uh, the first is Charlene Pluman, the Executive Director of the Downtown Oakville BIA. Welcome, <coughs> and uh, we look forward to your information. You have about 10 minutes. Hello, thank you, uh, Chair Adams and uh, Budget Committee. Thank you for having me here today and uh, for everyone to put up and listen to me for these 10 minutes. Um, we're here to talk specifically to the budget that's being set aside for the mitigation strategy that is a part of the downtown streetscape that's happening uh, starting this year in a few short months. And we're looking at this mitigation strategy and we're extremely appreciative that it's in place and we want to first thank the town uh, staff for putting it together because we think having it is um, putting us on a great first foot forward for this project. So we want to thank them for that. We do feel, though, that the funds allocated to it are a little bit shy of what we need to make it a successful strategy. So we're looking at um, requesting an increase for a few main things. So what I've addressed here in the letter is looking at the areas we would want to increase the mitigation strategy. So it's on the assumption that everything else from the strategy stays as, uh, as it's written right now. Um, we're looking at the free parking that's being offered and as it sits right now, it's currently suggesting free Saturdays and free first hour using the Honk app. Uh, we think that's a great start, but we'd like to expand the first free hour to include everybody who comes downtown. The way we look at it is the Honk app is new. Not everybody has it and not everybody's comfortable using an app on their phone to pay for purchases. And if we're looking at this as a way to say thank you for coming downtown, Thank you for getting around the disruption and dealing with it, being harder to find parking uh, and harder to navigate your way here, so first free hour is free. If we then say, but you have to do an extra step and do work that you might not be comfortable doing to get that free hour, I feel like we're dangling a bit of a carrot and pulling it away from them, and it's not doing justice to this benefit we're trying to introduce. So I think it would be uh, behoove us to say, let's just give the first hour free to everybody that's there. I think we can get creative in how we make that happen. I understand it can often mean work in terms of uh, monitoring it, but I think we can get really creative in how to make it happen without an increase uh, in, in service time from the uh, enforcement staff to monitor it. I think also we need to look at the marketing that's been set aside and the funds for it. I think that it's great we've set aside some funds for marketing, but uh, any of us who have done some marketing know that $30,000 doesn't get us very far. So I think if we're going to do it right, we need to invest the dollars at the beginning. And I think something along the lines of 100000 instead of thirty puts us in a better space to make sure that we let the community at large know this is happening, here's how you get here, here's the businesses, um, you know, doors if they have to be moved, all the businesses are still open, don't stop coming to us. That's a hard message to convey with only $30,000. Um, having spent some time trying to notify the entire community about events we're doing and always wishing we could do more, I know that money only goes so far, so let's invest what we need to now to make people know what's going on with this construction so they still keep coming down. The next suggestion is to look at the fees that are charged to the BIA for the services the town provides and could those fees be waived. We spend about 122000 that's based on 2018 fees, on things like renting spaces, uh, having banners installed, um, you know, having other services done like road closures. If those fees could be waived for the years of construction, we could apply that funding to, again, either additional marketing, to potentially um, not have to collect it from the businesses in the first place, to do you know, more events, to do more beautification to counteract the um, construction that's happening. The reason that we've looked at breaking it down this way is it doesn't impact all one budget at once. So we're not saying let's you know imply all of these fees that we're requesting to just parking or to just marketing, spreading the impact of that request across a couple of different budgets. And looking at it to really be able to help the businesses. When we look at other areas that have gone through this, on average we're going to see at least a 50% decline in sales um, because of the decline in foot traffic. 
Um, that was supported, this you know, stat that we researched was supported on the experience we just had with the Allen and Reynolds Street construction that happened October, November. Um, most of the businesses that I talked to, shy of uh, one whose business in particular um, does well with construction in the area, the rest all saw about a 50% decline because of that construction and disruption. So I don't think the stats we're seeing are a lie. and We've talked to other municipalities and we do think there's going to be a disruption. And so let's try to mitigate this. Um, I have people ask me to say, well, what do other towns do? And to be honest, I don't want to benchmark ourselves to other towns. I want to be the town that people want to be, um, as we are now. Let's maintain that status. So I think we need to go into this to say, if other towns have seen a 50% decline, let's not do what they're doing, because maybe we should approach this in a different manner. Um, so I think it, it is, does behoove us to spend this money you know, now. When we look at some of the plans that are being made to support things in the future, like studies that are happening, we know that we recognize the value of setting ourselves up for success in the future. There's $200,000 set aside in the parking budget this year for studies, which I think is important. I'm not saying it should go anywhere, but I think it speaks to the fact that we look to prepare ourselves and set ourselves up for success in the future, and we spend money doing it. So let's do that for this as well. Let's make sure that we've set downtown up for success for the future, and not for a desolate downtown that has to rebuild once this project is finished. So that's uh, our request in a nutshell. I will keep it brief because I think it's also explained there in the letter and therefore leave the um, time open to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Are there any questions? Councillor Elgar. Thanks very much for your presentation. I guess uh, if you can help me understand another half a million dollars you want for free parking. Yes. Um, okay, if you don't, how are you going to ma how are you gonna monitor that? So I think there's ways we can do it. Um, you know, obviously chalking the tires is one, but that's an expensive, man, you know, labor-intensive way. But I think we've got fancy machines downtown. There has to be a way that we can program it in, that when someone requests they want to park from 9 till 11, it only charges them for one hour. I think there's ways that we can, you know, we can do it effectively. Another way that we could look at is instilling a um, free parking with purchase. So they take their ticket that they've paid for um, to the store. When they make a purchase, the store reimburses them, keeps that receipt so that they can then collect a reimbursement at the end of the month or project, however we deem it appropriate. So I think there's ways we can do it if we get creative that won't involve a lot of extra labor on the staff, um, parking enforcement staff. Yeah, I see an awful lot of extra labor if you're going to do, try to do something other than through a, an application, which is hot. That's the problem we've got. And a half a million dollars. <clears throat> that's, so you're saying the taxpayers eat half a million, but that's basically... Uh, yes. Nice. Yep, I'm going to okay. not lie that about that, yeah. yes. I think, though, that it's an expense that is spread amongst the taxpayers is not a huge one and means that they have a downtown that they can, you know, have for years to come. Thank you. As well as Good evening. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, what is the BME <clears throat> doing currently uh, to increase the Honk app uptake? We, sorry, we advertise it on um, every document we put out that has our parking app on it. It's listed on there that the you know Honk is is an app uh, that they can use. On almost every postcard or unit that we send out, we include our parking map on it. So it's on. I'd have to go to look at the numbers to see the number of pieces. But as an example, uh, when we sent out the Christmas catalog uh, that we put out um, to all the homes in Oakville, so we sent out 70,000 of them to the homes, plus distributed them through the downtown. That was a part of that production. So, are are the business are the businesses themselves doing? Are the businesses themselves doing any type of promotion for Hong Kong? <coughs> Do you run any contests or anything uh, in order to um, get that uptake uh, quite yeah. wide? Um, I, I actually don't know the answer to how many businesses. We did ourselves run contests when the app was first introduced, but I don't know how many businesses have uh, followed suit. I could find that out for you. That'd be great. Uh, the other question I have is, because uh, you, you had talked about the loss of foot traffic, um, what percentage of the businesses downtown also include online purchasing as part of their uh, business? I, I don't know the number, the percentage. Um, some do, some don't. I don't know the percentage, but um, that is a thing that we're trying to encourage them to do more of uh, through the Digital Main Street program, which I'm, I'm appreciative that there's money in here towards that. Um, to try to get them doing those online sales throughout this process. That's 
sounds like a good idea. Thank you. Any others? Thank you very much for your information, then. We appreciate that, and we'll take it into consideration. Wonderful. Thank you for having me tonight. I believe that Karen Brock, the president of Oakville Green, is now in attendance. You're welcome to join us. Thank you very much. You have about 10 minutes. We'll forward your information. First of all, I want to uh, extend my thanks for accommodating me tonight. I wasn't sure when, when I was going to arrive, so I am here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Karen Brock, and uh, I'm uh, delegating tonight on behalf of Oakville Green Conservation Association, who have been active here in Oakville for almost 20 years now. So we're coming up to the 20th birthday very soon. Um, okay, so it's different than my map. Okay. Um, so I'm here to uh, delegate uh, regarding the Oakville Green and Leaf Backyard Tree Planting Program. Um, and today's proposal, uh, I'm asking for the town support to roll out the Backyard Tree Planting Program that was piloted successfully in 2018. Uh, the pro program has been run successfully for over 20 years in Toronto and extended to Ajax and York Region by our partner, Leaf. Um, in Toronto, so, uh, and they plant about 1,400 trees annually in the GTA area. Um, two options for you to consider, a base goal of 80 trees and uh, a stretch goal of 100. Um, and a little bit about the program, I think some of you know about it. Um, the homeowner pays a subsidized fee. They pay the $200 approximately on average, depending on, depends on the type of tree. Um, but what is included from uh, Oakville Green and Leaf uh, is the assessment of the planting site in backyards, so this is backyards only, by an arborist. So we hire a certified arborist. Uh, and basically the, the idea is the right tree in the right place. Uh, we recommend native trees uh, and shrub species just because they do well in this crazy red clay. Um, and provide habitat for the, the birds that live in this area and the, the critters that live here. Uh, the siting and the locates, uh, for many of you know how uh, difficult that can be, so that's provided uh, the tree purchase and the delivery. So Leaf uh, buys the trees, stores them in Toronto, uh, and brings them out here for the planting with us. Um, planting and homeowner education, which I think is a real key for the right care to make sure that these trees are gonna survive. Uh, and then a follow-up visit. So this is quite an unusual model. Um, funding of the uh, Oakville Green or OCA staff uh, and LEAF staff uh, is uh, for our operational support. And that's provided through this, the, uh, the grant. I, I think a uh, real key is the program, the trees have a 95% survival rate after five years. So. I can assure you that that is uh, pretty good, darn, uh, pretty darn good, especially in comparison to some of our uh, street trees. And again, the right care, right tree, right place. Uh, this is a picture of an arborist uh, appearing in someone's backyard just to advise them. Uh, after our, we have a, a survey that's filled out by the client interested, and there's also a, a post-planting survey that's done. And the number one reason that people like the program is because an arborist comes right to the site. Uh, and the, uh, the second thing was somebody does the planting. So uh, those are the two keys to the program as seen by the purchasers so far. Um, the pilot goal originally uh, we, uh, was to encourage homeowners to support a healthy and sustainable environment and of course all the benefits that we know that come with, with that. Um, the deliverable is to assist private homeowners to plant trees and shrubs in their backyards, and of course the uh, long-term survival rate uh, and, and the cost too is, is certainly appreciated. Um, education and community outreach are also key. I think if you can't just plant a tree if somebody doesn't want a tree. <laughs> in this case, we're lucky because people will uh, meet with us. Uh, some decide they don't, don't want a tree. In some cases, the uh, 
uh, the yards are just not that big. So in that case, a shrub would fit. Um, the operational strategy uh, is that we leverage the systems and processes and expertise of LEAF. Um, so they have a, a GIS system, they do the native tree sourcing, the locates, the tracking software. I provided the budget committee with a report that we presented to uh, forestry um, and uh, parks and rec uh, after our completion of our project last year. And uh, I think you'll see that there are some pretty significant uh, statistics that we're, we're proud of. So this tracking software is uh, something that we cannot replicate if we just did it on our own. Uh, and the delivery, the uh, uh, leaf takes care of the truck rental and gas and getting the tree here. Uh, originally, the idea, of, I've had this idea in my mind for many years, but we were successful in getting a Trillium grant uh, for the first year pilot, and that was at the end of 2017, and the pilot ended in 2018, in August 2018, and that's when we, uh, we had hoped that the town would help us extend, and of course, that was extremely uh, successful to increase the number of total trees planted. I'm happy to say that uh, the program was a resounding success. Uh, in total, we planted 101 trees, so we were so pleased with that when our original target was 40. Um, so they're sold and planted and uh, 80 trees was ultimately went from 40, bumped it up to, uh, to 80. So 101 trees is, is what we're pleased about. I think the real surprise for us uh, and a real bonus were uh, 89 shrubs were sold. Uh, and as I think the budget committee can see there's still all the benefits of the trees, the carbon sequestration, the stormwater. Um, absorption and so on. Uh, so these are still very beneficial to uh, Oakville's green infrastructure. Um, the post-planting surveys showed a top 90.5% uh, top box satisfaction, satisfaction rating uh, with regards to staff courtesy and knowledge and the convenience of the program. Uh, I think this map is very interesting because it shows you basically a pretty even distribution um, throughout uh, all of Oakville. Uh, this was something we weren't sure what was going to happen. And even in the new areas of uh, uh, Oakville Ward 7, uh, you can see that there are uh, quite a few trees planted there too. So that is the distribution. Um, client testimonials, I think that was really key to, to get people's feedback and again all part of the post-planting uh, assessment that we did. Um, they made it very, LEAF program made it very simple to apply, receive the on-site consultation, selection and planting. So people are often very eager to recommend. And you'll see uh, on the bar graph that talks about how people heard about the program, a uh, referral from a neighbor uh, and from someone else who'd already received a tree uh, was in effect. So that's uh, an important factor. And again, clear communication, back to basics approach. So people in general, uh, their number one reason and motivation to plant a tree was for the environment, which again, I think speaks to a lot of the information we know that a lot of residents in Oakville are very concerned about the environment. Uh, why is this program important? Uh, Oakville has a canopy target of 40% by 2057. And after the iTree assessment uh, in 2015, it showed that our canopy cover was uh, just about 28%. So we know that we're going to require uh, thousands of trees to be planted annually in order to meet that target. Uh, the key is that even if we planted out on public property, we're not going to achieve the goal without planting on private property. So 60% of available planting area is on private property. So we wanted to capitalize on that. Uh, there are no other programs addressing planting on private property, so uh, we're the ones. Uh, the program is built, proven, and operationally efficient. Uh, program can deliver against multiple town strategies, so uh, commitments regarding climate change, stormwater management strategies, uh, and air quality and biodiversity, etc. <coughs> Uh, Long-term vision, we would like to see this program uh, perpetuate the same way it has in uh, Toronto and other municipalities. Ultimately, 
it would be a goal to scale the program to let's say a thousand trees per year to have a meaningful impact on the 40% canopy target. Um, we could make the economics to make it more self-sustaining uh, by increasing the homeowner contribution. Um, the corporate sponsorship is something that we, we know is, hope is possible. Uh, we've tried, uh, but nobody, uh, <laughs> nobody's taken this up on it so far, so we're going to keep trying at that. And really the economy of scale versus the fixed cost, so the more we uh, plant, uh, the better it's going to work out for everyone. And uh, we did offer to commercial and multi-unit properties, but word of mouth, we're just trying to sort of generate that, uh, that interest. So that's a possibility that we can go uh, and spread through those other means. Uh, reasons to continue uh, the re rebate programs will have a lower tree survival. Uh, because I think really uh, are the key is the right tree in the right plant place planted properly. We've uh, been many places and seen trees planted so badly and they're just simply not going to survive. So, uh, And operationally, um, it's much less complex for the town. Uh, this requires basically no town resources. Uh, the town did work with us and did do some promotion, um, but really it's, it's pretty simple. Um, the program's ready to go now. We're sort of on a roll. Tree, uh, tree planting is like compound interest. The sooner you start, the greater the impact. And investment, I think that's just about the only investment that any municipality can make that actually increases in value over years. Uh, the subsidized program actively encourages homeowners to replace dead ash trees which we know is a, a big problem and some people that we did meet and talk with were uh, actively trying to create more privacy by planting a tree and also replace the, uh, the trees that they lost. So, of course, that's 10% of our uh, urban forest canopy has been lost or is, is impacted by EAB uh, of the ash trees. It's a uh, cost-effective option for citizens required to replant according to a private tree protection bylaw, and that's another area uh, we did speak, uh, or we did think of speaking with the bylaw staff just to share that with them. And I think in the statistics, I think there were at least two occasions where. Karen, I just note that you've hit your 10-minute mark. One oh, okay. Getting closer. Okay. How am I? Okay. Fast forward to <laughs> um, our ask, uh, $50,000 uh, for 100 trees or 40000 for 80. You can see the breakdown there divided among um, the arborist and leaf and OCA staff costs. And uh, the deliverables, of course, uh, I think are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, but the education workshops would be included and all the metrics that we provided before. So there's my summary. Um, the backyard tree planting program is a positive, well-received, cost-effective solution to growing Oakville's urban canopy. Uh, the Oakville Green Leaf Backyard Tree Planting Program has a demonstrated rationale, excellent uptake, ongoing community demand, and tree planting effectiveness. Uh, continuation of municipal funding enables this key program to continue to contribute to Oakville's municipal urban forest canopy renewal goals. Thank you. So, are there questions? Are there questions? Councilor Chair. Thank you for coming tonight, Karen. Um, you mentioned that uh, the survival rate of private trees is 95% uh, for five years, but you compared it to a public uh, tree. So do you have any data from Oakville Green about when, when residents plant trees in mm. their own backyards, they're, they're much more likely to take care of it. Are you saying that the 95% is much lower if it's not through the LEAF program? Uh, I guess I'm referring to the street trees. We know that street trees have a much tougher life, but, uh, um, but I think the key is the success of the program. And I know LEAF has tried to um, <coughs> Uh, streamline the program uh, more, but I think the key still is having an arborist, an on-site arborist report, so that is a part of our, our cost. But the survival rate is definitely choosing the right tree. Uh, sorry. 
So I, I guess I'm trying to understand how the um, the education component of this or, or percentage of it because so you had indicated that 2017 18 was about 75,000 and then 40,000 was contribution from the town in right. 2018 mm -hmm. and in total there was the 101 trees right. that were planted so that's mm -hmm. about $1,150 or sorry $1,150 per tree how much of that would you estimate would be the educational component because the uh, the residents still also paid for the tree. Right, yeah, so. and, and uh, the cost of the tree uh, is uh, we pay to um, uh, LEAF, which is about 250 to $300. And then so the, that's on top of the resident uh, cost? No, it? and then the resident pays LEAF. Okay. So it's about 400, uh, between 400 and $500 per tree. I see. So ultimately, so it is a subsidized program. So about six or seven hundred of that is the educational component. For the uh, yeah, I think our breakdown last year, we uh, I think we spent five thousand dollars on the uh, a tree tenders program, which was a series of uh, events. Uh, sorry, a series of workshops, and then a t a to open to everybody. And then uh, we had also five thousand dollars going towards. Uh, tree tours, tree inventory workshop, and uh, community tree planting event. So, do you know stats in Toronto, for instance, with LEAF? Are, are they paying a lot less per tree than we are here? No, no. So we're, that's, that's why we have that relationship, and they're the ones who are sourcing the trees, and obviously uh, the greater number that we use, there's a, a greater efficiency. We have to f hire a an arborist no matter what, so that is a certain uh, you know, flat fee, but then there's a, a you know a scale so that the more trees we plant, it, it's going to cost less. So, uh, for example, we forty thousand dollars. I know that uh, last year we proposed that we were going to plant forty trees, and someone said, "Oh, it's a thousand dollars a tree." <laughs> um, but um, so you could look at it that it's you know five hundred dollars a tree this year. Again, just sort of economy of scale. Um, would you mind going back a couple slides in your deck there about your, your funding request? So mm -hmm. that's your funding request is? 50. 50, yeah. Okay. So I guess we'd divide everything in, in half. So part of it's for the arborist, part of it is the direct funding to leaf, to, uh, leaf purchasing the Stuff, Trees, it? yes, and their software system, their GIS, um, our staff, uh, the arborist would go into Toronto sometimes as well to uh, use their equipment, um, use their uh, GIS system. Okay, and, um, and what was your next slide down? Uh, and $10,000, that's for the marketing and promotion of the program. I think you see in the report there that they're two sheets, uh, we have the arborist uh, going to um, different public events, um, also sharing printing uh, information and putting uh, things on social media, um, just getting the word out there, doing the promotion right here in our community. Okay, and your next slide after this, that's your list of the things that, uh, is that your, that's your fifty thousand dollar house there. It is, yeah, so that's for hundred trees, so right? So the the extra twenty thousand, or so the extra you know, twenty trees for ten thousand is the, the difference between the two hundred trees. Basically, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. We could probably do all the same education uh, uh, pieces for forty thousand dollars, but. But I think just seeing the, the demand that we've had, uh, I think we could reach that target um, okay. of 100 trees. Th thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, I have a question from Councillor Elder, but before I go to him, I just want to make sure from our staff that we've got access to this presentation, because uh, I think it just got put on to the long time. Just mm -hmm. now, is that correct? So if that could be... No, I have access. You do I have it. Okay, yes. so if you can distribute that. Mm -hmm. okay. Councillor Elder? Yeah, thanks, thanks for coming, Karen. Karen, mm -hmm. straight up. So, last year it was $1,000 a tree. This year you got it down to a, a 500 <laughs> tree, right? Is that basically the... There, there were program development costs. This, this was something no, no, new no, that yeah, uh, the LEAF had not tried, and, and this was our opportunity to see if we could make that work. So, there was quite a bit more 
uh, meeting work involved in how this was going to work between the two organizations in collaboration. So you can make it work though with the 503? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, can I ask our staff? Uh, thank you very much. Karen. Okay. I have a question of our staff. Um, just with respect to this kind of a program, last year we, we did a one-time grant. Um, this is a, an ongoing program, and I want to understand whether we would run afoul of any purchasing bylaws with respect to uh, single sourcing uh, the planting program with another organization. Through you, Mr. Chair, I, I think this would be considered more of a grant to them because they would do the purchasing, not us. Uh, but I could go back to our purchasing department to confirm that. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no other questions of our staff, we have one more delegation this evening uh, that's listed, the Young Zay, regarding the new community center in North Oakville. She might have just walked out the door for a minute. I just saw somebody leave. It might have been her. We have a staff member who will check. I was informed that you, oh, Mayor and Councillors, uh, thank you for having, having me today. Uh, I was informed to come here at 4 o'clock, so I have not uh, really ready for a lot of questions here. Uh, I just uh, want to uh, come here to say that I'm the resident of Ward 7 and uh, live in the neighborhood of the preserve. And I want to address the uh, increasing needs to build a new community center in the north of Oakville. Uh, I work in Oakville as well in a financial institution. Um, I see a lot of, uh, two years back I moved here, I see a lot of uh, uh, change in this region and a lot of newcomers and the new movers uh, move into this region. And you see a lot of uh, buildings, a lot of uh, uh, houses uh, have been uh, built up. Uh, we see that uh, um, the past four, three years, uh, the population in Oakville increased already to the two, over 200,000. And mainly, I think, from the new regions. Uh, you see the new builders and the, like the preserve, uh, uh, Seven Oaks, uh, uh, those, uh, yeah. Uh, so they have become a, a big region, and uh, so we think that uh, as the population grow, uh, we see that it's more important. Uh, of course, it's very important to invest on the trees, but uh, more important to invest on people also, yeah. Uh, because people have, <laughs> uh, have the moves, have the motions, right? So we, it's more directly to spend money on that. Uh, the past years, the Oakville already seen uh, those population increase, and this region, the the home price, uh, you know, it's a bit crazy. The past years has been uh, overestimated, so the owners of the house has paid a lot of uh, property tax. So as the tax payers, uh, we we think that uh, we deserve a community center uh, to accommodate those residents living in these regions. Um, so uh, they, they need to have a place to sit down to uh, know their neighbors, to talk to each other and to make friends, and maybe share some information, how to find a family doctor, because uh, they move from other cities, from, from other regions, uh, cross border, or you know, yeah. So from another countries. So they don't know nothing here. And so they need to know how to enroll their kids in school. And also that they need to, um, uh, to bridge their skills, uh, improve their language, and to see what the, is the job opportunities, the volunteer opportunities, 
uh, to find a job in Canada, that kind of thing, yeah. So it's very important to have a community center here. Uh, I would like to share my personal experience because I'm also the beneficiary of the, a, a good community center. Uh, the 13 years back, uh, I came to Canada as a newcomer. Uh, the first, uh, I know nothing about here. I, I don't know my future will be what kind of a picture, right? But uh, the first place I went for help is a community center, and uh, they provide us a lot of services, programs uh, that show me that where you can register a family doctor and where you can help your kids to enroll the school, and how you can have a link or ESL a school to improve your English. And also uh, they show us how to bridge us to become sor sort of uh, useful people uh, and then work in the workplace. What's the culture here? What's the job opportunity there? Uh, how to open, uh, apply for a social insurance number, you know, open a bank account, that kind of thing, yeah. So uh, you never know, uh, you know, what's the problem that people move from other place or relocated into a, a strange place, right? It's uh, totally new. So uh, it's, it's good to have this place. Uh, we are, I appreciate about this kind of service provide to me. So uh, I think I'm the beneficiary. I want to uh, pay back this, uh, you know, uh, to uh, other people who move into a new place. So th this is another reason. And all, of course, that in, uh, in Oakville, uh, the population uh, is, is much younger than other region, uh, comparing with other cities. Uh, I think our, ha our population have a 28% of young kids. Uh, other places maybe have 24%. Uh, so those kids uh, also need a new, uh, not only parks, but also community center and the new public schools as well. So uh, I think that is uh, another reason that we uh, need a company to the new younger generation. Okay, so that is good that like we have a younger generation, uh, younger people than other cities, right? So they are going to be the future uh, taxpayers, right? Uh, so that's another reason. Uh, so I. So again, so uh, my personal experience, I'm the beneficiary of the new community center, and uh, also uh, I, 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 uh, the young people is have the needs to have a new community center to sitting down to make friends to have uh, you know uh, uh, to know their friends and to settle down in Canada. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, it's really there's uh, please. Uh, Evaluate it necessary uh, to have a new community center in the new region, uh, the north of Oakville. Uh, that's a large populated place. Uh, thank you for having me here. Thank you very much on your questions. I have a question. Councilor Elgar. Yeah. Uh, I thank you for coming. But what you're saying um, about you need it, and I don't disagree, you do need it but I don't think the population is, is there yet to support it. I think I heard around, you know, around 45,000 people like to support a community, uh, uh, to a community center. I, w I wonder whether in the short term, whether the best thing you can have is a good community association to meet, uh, like a, a place to meet. Have you thought about you could head that up? Do you try to, what you want to do is try to get people to more knowledgeable about where to go, how to find doctors and all that type. Uh, like a community association could be very helpful. I, I just feel when I hear what the numbers are north of uh, Dundas right now, they're still relatively low. Oh, well, we have so many people that is very uh, dense uh, uh, residents there, and uh, so many uh, houses and uh, so many newcomers. But uh, when they uh, send their kids. Uh, uh, to like a swimming or you know some new programs they have to uh, drive them back to the, the south uh, across the can uh, Dandas and then to find a community center to yeah right. there yeah. and even they want to borrow a book that uh, they have to go to the south of Dandas to to have that you know yeah yeah so we we don't have so many resources unfortunately no, no, no and I appreciate that but it, it's like I think right now, I think I heard that the community center would be, it's around the 27, uh, 2027 time frame at this point. So what, what do you mean that? The year 2027. 
Oh, like I think in oh. the mid 2020s. Oh, you mean we already have a plan for 2027? Yeah. For that? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, that's that would be good. Yeah, we can wait. <laughs> yeah, you will get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we just want to enhance this uh, uh, plan. Uh, yes. Yeah, we really need that uh, in the north of Dundas. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I think everybody agrees. It's just the, it's the timing. Uh, yeah. To get it, so. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. No problem. We can win. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go to Councilor Chin. And before I do, I'm just going to warn the staff that I'm going to ask them if they could uh, provide some information with respect to what is in our capital plan and the final plan with respect to what is planned for a community center there. Councilor Chin. Beyond, thank you for coming. Uh, you obviously speak very passionately about it and your experiences. I'm just concerned, is there a number of residents that come to you asking about supports that you've mentioned, a uh, family doctor or, or a language, all that type of thing? Um, what I would recommend is that you contact your new counselors. Oh, so Councillor Parmar and Councillor Sandu, and I'm sure they would be happy to refer you to a lot of the, the services that are already provided in Oakville where residents can get those uh, supports. Oh, who's we'll know that? Thank you. Thank you. Your Bird. Okay. okay. I'm going to ask if our staff wouldn't mind providing a, an update to you with respect to the timing of the library mm -hmm. facility that is being planned for the upcoming year for the 16 mile sports complex location, as well as the upcoming plans for both field um, uses as well as the community center that's planning to really put into this. I'm not sure if I'm calling Bell, so I'd like to speak uh, that one. Through you, Mr. Chair, I'd first of all like to um, highlight the fact that we are going to be opening a temporary library uh, in the next six months uh, at uh, 16 Mile. And it will be about 5,000 square feet and it will include both uh, full library services and programming. But also, it's an integrated model with the recreation and culture uh, team. So we will be providing multi-generational uh, multi programming there. So um, that is one of our, our most exciting projects right now. Uh, in addition to that, in uh, January of 2020, mm -hmm. we will be uh, reopening the Glen Abbey Library. It will be fully renovated, and it will have a creation zone that um, is a major focus on digital literacy. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a, a hugely popular amenity at Iroquois Ridge right now. And given the number of uh, people in the north who want their children to be learning coding and also learning uh, other applications, we think it's going to be a very exciting project to be introducing to the community. So those are sort of short-term pieces. Um, then we are also looking at timing around the sports fields that are immediately behind um, 16 Mile Community Centre. Uh, one of the big uh, requests has been a cricket field, uh, because we do not have a, a permanent cricket field uh, in Oakville. We have a temporary one. And uh, we are looking at introducing that, we're looking at the capital budget to see how we can accelerate moving that one forward. And behind that space also will be a dog park, a BMX uh, facility, and additional uh, sports fields as well. And then for um, the actual permanent 16-mile uh, community center and library, that's slated to start uh, construction in 2027 mm -hmm. with an opening in 2028. Oh, that sounds amazing. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions before we finish up? Thank you very much for your uh, delegation this evening. We appreciate hearing from you. I hope that uh, some of this information will uh, help you understand where we're going. With this yeah, project. definitely. So, thank you. Okay, thank you again. I'm going to check to make sure, I don't have anybody else registered as a delegation tonight, but I'm just going to double check that I'm not missing anybody in the audience there. Is there anybody else who wants to provide information to us this evening? I don't see any hands. Then thank you very much everybody. Uh, we are ready to take a motion to receive the uh, presentations and delegations regarding the 2019 operating uh, and capital budget. Councilor Lashuna has moved receipt of all this information. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. We have no other information. Uh, we have no uh, other discussion or confidential discussion items, so we are going to adjourn. Just to remind everybody that we will be coming back uh, on the 22nd for a delegate. Uh,
deliberation meeting to make some recommendations to council with respect to the budget. And again, the recommendations from that meeting will also be going to the January 28th council meeting at 7 p.m. Again, the council meeting will be held over at the region of Halton, over on the Road for those who are interested. Thank you very much, everybody. We are now adjourned.